My objectives for the talk will be to understand the chronic intermittent hypoxia in preterm infant. What is it? How to quantify it with trends and histograms? How common it is? How significant? Why does it happen? And how can we prevent it? So uh, we, all of us, when we do our rounds in the morning, uh, we hear that this baby had six or seven desaturations throughout the days. They keep having those very short desaturation with normal, with return to normoxia. That's intermittent hypoxia. When you have that desat followed by normoxia. And then when it happens over many weeks in during the stay of NICU, we call it chronic intermittent hypoxia. Those hypoxia don't uh, reach to be, be called apnea because uh, they're not 20 seconds of cessation of breathing or 15 seconds with bradycardia. So they are just desaturations. So we, I hope you get a uh, idea about the histograms and trends and how they can help to quantify uh, the, the events of hypoxia, hyperoxia. Now, how common is chronic intermittent hypoxia? You see, the frequency depends on your definition of hypoxia. If we say we want to capture only those below 85, then we have less frequency than if we put our, uh, yes, our limit is always 90 to 95 uh, for preterm babies, extreme preterms, but uh, we might want to capture those below 88 or those below 85 to call them chronic intermittent hypoxia. The definition affects the frequency. The postnatal age also is very relevant. You see on the graph, this is a graph showing us the number of hypoxic events per week. So on the x-axis is week one, week two, week three, and so on till week eight. On the y-axis, you see how many times per, per week the patient had hypoxia. We see from the graph that first one to two weeks of life, we have much less hypoxia, uh, possibly and many reviews or studies have shown the same, possibly because the patient has still fetal hemoglobin, which uh, is greedy of oxygen, so you kept saturating well even when his, when the tissue is hypoxic. So also the patient is usually having a non-damaged lung at this stage still, and uh, he's having, as I said, fetal hemoglobin. So later on, and he's less active usually, but uh, because he's on so much sedations and uh, maybe morphine, fentanyl. So, but when the patient reach four to five weeks or four to six weeks of age, you reach a peak of uh, hypoxic event. Look at it, it's about 650 per week, which is nearly 100 desaturations per day. None of us have seen a nursing record showing 100 desaturations per day, but it is common. So, um, why? Because now the lung is damaged, it's adult hemoglobin, and the patient is more active, maybe less sedated at four or five weeks of age, extubated. Then later on, it will decrease. So um, this is a postnatal age affect, affecting the frequency. How does the percent of hemoglobin F affect, I would say, the tissue? There is a uh, systematic review done in 2021 uh, as you see, many, many uh, articles uh, tried to include, but at the end, they found four studies that were relevant to, the, to it. Uh, as you see, uh, fetal hemoglobin has a very high affinity to oxygen. That means uh, it doesn't give oxygen to the tissue. So if you don't give oxygen to the tissue, you might have normal saturation, but less tissue oxygenation. So they tried to find uh, by near, near infrared spectroscopy in these four studies, if uh, the percent of fraction of hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin, F is fraction, so the, or the proportion of fetal hemoglobin versus total hemoglobin, how much does it affect the fraction of oxygen extraction in the brain or the uh, muscle? They found in those four studies, well, the brain ox extraction of oxygen is not affected by the proportion of fetal hemoglobin but the extraction of oxygen from the muscle is affected, is increased when you have more fetal hemoglobin. How much is relevant to chronic intermittent hypoxia? I don't know, but uh, it is a relevant point that whether your baby is fetal hemoglobin or adult hemoglobin. So now we, uh, uh, we would like to know how, uh, what problem do they bring, you know? What problem do we have from that? 
So oxygen, we all know since 70 years ago, since the 1950 and the blindness that happened due to oxygen, we know that uh, oxygen is a devil. So, uh, and here is the study showing uh, in the X-axis, -X -X the postnatal aging week and how many hyperoxic events here. And those who had laser ROP versus those who had no laser or no ROP, certainly they had more hyperoxic event. So oxygen is a devil, but if oxygen is a devil, that doesn't mean that uh, that doesn't mean that hypoxia is an angel. So here is the same picture, even more significant, showing that uh, the rate of laser ROP is increased in patients who had more hypoxic events. So it's even worse when you have a hypoxic event and hyperoxic event like the patient in the same patient as the one I showed you before. So again, about the significance of hypoxia, we said that uh, uh, the hypoxia and hyperoxia, both of them are significant for the outcome. There are many factors that are relevant. The timing of event, as I will show you now, the number, duration, and depth of those events, and is that patient having at the same time problem of oxygen carrying capacity like anemia, hypoxemia, hypoperfusion, and hyperoxia. So here is about the timing of the hypoxia. You can see that the, the hypoxia cause problem more when different problems at different stages. They divided it here in three phases. In phase one, hypoxia causes IVH, causes chronic lung disease, causes cognitive delay, but the hypoxia immediately after birth is not the one causing ROP. That's the hypoxia that happened around one month of age and forward when the vessels started to grow where the ROP will happen. You have some with two phases like the BPD and the IVH. So timing of hypoxia affects the outcome. Now, the duration and depth of hypoxia are relevant. This is a very large study because uh, it come, it's a post hoc analysis from the COT trial, Canadian Oxygen Trial. That was the trial who was trying to compare uh, 85 to 90 versus 90 to 95 saturation to answer the question whether we can reduce the rate of ROP by selecting a target 85 to 90. And they demonstrated in the COT trial that we reduce ROP but we increased mortality and some um, cognitive problems. So the recommendation is still 90 to 95 for most units. But the post hoc analysis demonstrated, uh, they recalculated, counted the number of hypoxic events, and they found that uh, there is an association, this is a relative risk association between hypoxic event and uh, death or disability, cognitive delay, Motor impairment with a relative risk of 3.5, that's a 250% increase. And also severe ROP, which would need laser, it's nearly two. So uh, this says that hypoxic events are relevant. We can't come and say, don't worry, baby is not having apnea, uh, let's continue. No, no, hypoxia is relevant, but now what to do about it, that's a problem. I'll give you here, uh, uh, to discuss the other issue, it's not only the hypoxic event, what comes with it as anemia, hypoperfusion. So here is a patient that had some certain neuro and um, uh, some uh, epilepsy plus lung agenesis. We have the gene for that disease. Whatever it is, the patient unfortunately died last weekend. He was six months old. Uh, we managed his um, problems initially, but remained in hospital and was to go to California. What happened, uh, he, the only lung he has, which is the left lung, got severe pneumonia in it, as you can see in the right-hand picture. So, and he was in severe shock, received every treatment that you could treat for shock. And at some stage he had improved and we had weaned uh, dopamine, dobutamine. He was still only on epinephrine and norepinephrine. And now his mean arterial pressure was beautiful, 80. So I thought, you know, let's look at the pulsatility index to see if that 80 of uh, blood pressure is perfusion well the body or it will just produce in such an alpha effect 
with little perfusion to the periphery. So the histogram shows, interestingly here, that uh, the patient uh, had 41% perfusion index below the target. That means, you know, uh, we are happy with the number of 80 millimeter mercury, but the tissue is not happy. So uh, do I act about it? I thought, you know, I don't wanna play with a game that I don't understand well. I, sa I said, let's continue weaning on the way we usually wean uh, inotropes without acting based on the pulsatility index. You might act it or not act it, but I didn't act based on the pulsatility index. I said, keep doing what you're doing as weaning process, uh, not to play with something I don't understand. So what happened after, they, uh, we weaned him normally out of epinephrine. And then I did a histogram when epinephrine was off. That was only a few hours later. And uh, the histogram was 100% within target. So it's relevant when we treat a shock, not to only know is it distributive shock or vasoconstrictive shock, but also to see the effect of what you give as medicine on the perfusion index. Now, when you see it, what to do about it, it's another question. Another interesting case that I had was a 24-week or 760-grammer out of the loop and now to go home, but had the chronic lung disease. So confirmed pulmonary hypertension and treated with sildenafil. So after treatment with sildenafil for only the interest of it, I thought, let's see the uh, sildenafil is a vasodilator. Let's see the pulsatility index. And very interesting that the pulsatility index showed 11% above target. Does it mean is it caused by the sildenafil? Would it mean that the sildenafil is vasodilating the pulmonary vessel as much as it's vasodilating the peripheral vessel? But uh, it's a relevant finding. So whenever we give sildenafil to try to learn by looking at the PI index, histogram. So now I progress towards the end of my talk, but uh, uh, we wonder why do we have uh, those hypoxia happening so often? Uh, and uh, what happens when we get them? So why does it happen? I have four theories that are the most prevalent theories. One of them is the imbalance between peripheral and central chemoreceptors. We'll talk about it. Second one is low CO2 apneic threshold in preterm baby, the pro-inflammatory cascade and other causes of TSAT. Hope you're not tired already, but uh, to uh, revive those who start to feel hungry or tired, you have 1000 dirham. This is my suggestion. Then if you are five answering, you'll get 5,000, 10 answering 10,000 dirham. So my question to you, uh, this is a chicken egg question. Uh, which one comes first? Is it the tachypnea? This, are, this is a patient on periodic breathing. So classically we say, uh, like you have a tachypnea, uh, you have an apnea of 10 seconds, 12 seconds, and the apnea of up to 20, 10 seconds is followed by compensatory tachypnea. Or is it that the tachypnea is causing the apnea. Which one comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is the tachypnea preceding to the apnea? I wouldn't call it apnea, to the period of cessation of breathing for the periodic breathing. Is it tachypnea before cessation of breathing or is it cessation of breathing before tachypnea? Any answer from the team? You can put your speaker up if you have an answer. What would go you for support? the uh, hypoxia happening first and then the tachypnea as a compensatory response. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sridhar. Anyone else would like to also give a suggestion which one comes first? I would vote for the same answer. You vote for the same. The I mean, the, the, the periodic breathing, um, the apnea, and then compensated by the kidney. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, anyone else wants to make money? So, that's honestly, Dr. Sridal, what I, Dr. Sridhar and Dr. Muhammad, what I used to think, but this is not true. I'll explain it. What happens is the tachypnea preceding the apnea. It's not, it doesn't seem logic, but you'll understand it clearly from the second two slides, from the two slides that come below. So the tachypnea comes before the apnea, not the apnea before the tachypnea. And let's see why. 
So here is the adult control of breathing. The explanation will come in the next slide. But in adult, there is a good uh, uh, coordination between the peripheral chemoreceptor and central chemoreceptor. So the peripheral chemoreceptor, you see it on your right hand side. Peripheral chemoreceptors are sensitive to hypoxia and acidosis, low PO2, low pH. And those chemoreceptors are present in the cross of the aorta and carotid bodies. So when you have hypoxia, high, uh, low, low pH, they will fire very quickly to the brainstem to order the brainstem to breathe. At the same time, the high CO2 will go to the brain. In the brain, there is all over the brain, there are chemoreceptors for high CO2. And those chemoreceptors will fire uh, also chemical products down to the brainstem to breathe. So you have two orders coming at the same time one from the peripheral chemoreceptor and one from the central chemoreceptor telling the brain to breathe or when you have low CO2 to decrease the rate of breathing and so on. So there is no discordance in adults between peripheral and central chemoreceptor. What will happen in the preterm babies? In the preterm babies, the peripheral chemoreceptor are much, much more powerful and more, more quick to act than the central chemoreceptor. What will happen, you have a slightly low PO2, slightly low pH, chemoreceptor in the periphery work much quicker, much stronger, the brain stem start to breathe fast. They will stimulate the brain stem and the patient start breathing. Breathing will cause CO2 to go a little down. When the CO2 goes a little down, immediately after it will inhibit now the central chemoreceptor. By inhibiting the central chemoreceptor, it will inhibit the brain stem center of breathing and then the patient will get apnea so this is why contrary to what i honestly i used to think myself i used to think a, a patient stops breathing because his brain is not mature and then immediately after he compensate by tachypnea no this is not what happens you have the chemoreceptors from the periphery will stimulate the brain to breathe the, it breathes fast and this will cause the apnea because breathing fast will lower CO2 and causes periodic breathing. Tachypnea before apnea. So uh, Dr. Muhammad and Dr. Sridhar, can you get the, give the others every 1,000 dirham? Okay, so, so I just have a question. So to start with, why this baby had low BO2 then um, to stimulate the chemoreceptor? Yes. It's, From the beginning. It, it is not a low, it's a good question. I, I don't know if the answer will be satisfactory. The other but, point is also that, I mean, hypoxia causes apnea in the small babies. So, I mean, if you look at the pathophysiology yes, of apnea, yes. they have a paradoxical response to hypoxia. So, it's still not solved. So, nobody gives anyone money. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Halas, you're saved from that. But the point is, we're not talking here about true hypoxia, which can cause apnea, yes. We're not talking about the true hypoxia. We're talking about this very slight variation of the oxygen or pH below the level to say that it's abnormal. As this is like our brain, our peripheral chemoreceptor. Maybe your PO2 will go down uh, from uh, uh, just within normal, just slightly down. And that will stimulate the brain stem to breathe before the center of the brain think of it. So it is not hypoxia per se. I called it hypoxia. It's a slight reduction in PO2, slight reduction in pH. Now, what happened to cause those? I, uh, I would say, I don't know that uh, many reasons for which the baby will have a slight drop of, uh, minimal drop of O2 that wouldn't be seen to your eye or to the monitor to anything. But this is at least one strong theory about periodic breathing and desaturations. Uh, the imbalance between peripheral and central chemoreceptor, and they detected that in uh, in rats, something like 2005, or uh, so it is, uh, they, they studied it uh, well, and then they studied it in newborn infant. So, Dr. Rampar, so what will happen if we give uh, babies who had frequent TSAs, um, if we give them like um, a little bit of oxygen? then we will stop the periodic breathing, right? We go yeah. to continuous regular breathing and then yeah. we'll avoid the desat. 
you know, um, you, many questions are intelligent questions, but uh, I wouldn't be able to answer them because I wouldn't, uh, I see your point. Uh, like I give you the example to answer partially your question. My patient who had uh, uh, all the time hypoxia and hyperoxia, uh, when he showed ROP stage two already and zone one to two, and I was worried then he progressed for uh, ROP stage three, which uh, he progressed to and had resented then. Our ophthalmologist, he's your ophthalmologist as well. He asked me at that time to, uh, to target maybe 94, 96 of saturation rather than 90, 94 to avoid the hypoxia because uh, when you have already ROP, hypoxia exaggerate the ROP. So we did that, it didn't make a difference, but uh, uh, so to your question, if we give oxygen, what will happen? Uh, the problem is if you give oxygen, it might put him in hyperoxia. But I see in many expert opinion, patient with frequent hypoxia, they recommend to increase oxygen to 23, 24% oxygen. We're not talking about 40% oxygen. Hoping that 22, 23, 24% oxygen will not bring them to the toxic hyperoxic effect of, uh, of high saturation. This is partial answer because uh, there is no literature to answer your questions. So I have the same questions like you. I would say, yes, as you see in the recommendation below, give slight little bit of oxygen 23, 22, but not to any baby. And we, nobody would recommend for periodic breathing uh, to give oxygen for now. But if you start having very prolonged and frequent hypoxia, you might give 22, 23%. Can I progress? So I already explained two theory, two theories. One of them uh, was, uh, uh, as I said, uh, the imbalance between central and uh, peripheral chemoreceptor. Another one is the low, low CO2 threshold. In adult, the difference between, uh, is it fine? You're with me, huh? So in adult, uh, you can't cause a patient to, by asking him to breathe fast. You cannot cause him to be apneic, honestly, because there is five millimeter mercury between the apneic CO2 threshold and the apneic CO2 threshold. He has to breathe so fast to go down by more than five to reach the apneic threshold. In very preterm, preterm babies, uh, the apneic CO2 threshold and apneic threshold are really touching each other. It's only difference of 1.5 millimeter mercury. So you can be um, uh, 40 of CO2, you go down to 38 and you start having uh, apnea. So um, you go below the threshold and it causes you apnea and desaturations. So one of them is central chem preferred chemoreceptors are uh, in, not in balance with central chemoreceptors. Second one is a low CO2 threshold. Third one is a pro-oxidant cascade. Prematurity and inflammation cause, uh, prematurity often comes with infection and causes inflammation. And all of this will go damage the lung in addition to our ventilation, which damage the lung. Not only that, it will cause further imp impairment of uh, the peripheral and central chemoreceptor. Both factors will cause intermittent hypoxia the hypoxia itself will open a cascade by inducing pro-inflammatory uh, pro-oxidant cascade, which uh, increases the secretion of cytokines and uh, oxidative stress. And all of this become a uh, closed circuit. Um, the cause become the effect and the effect becomes the cause. So uh, causing the harm. Last uh, slide about uh, why it happens. Immature baby have small lung, small functional residual capacity, small oxygen stores. They are uh, have they have apnea of prematurity. They have fetal hemoglobin, and on top of that, we damage their lungs. And the damage uh, chronic lung disease has less pulmonary stores of oxygen. It's associated with pulmonary hypertension and often anemia. So many factors. So I know you're tired now. I go to the my, my last point. How can we treat slash prevent uh, chronic intermittent hypoxia? And there is no real literature about it to say how. You have experts speaking and you try yourself and you find what you did as I showed you in a few patients, in two patients, 
I, I, I did what I think is correct, but didn't make a difference. So certainly make sure like your caffeine dose is increased uh, with the patient weight and maybe go up to 15 milligram kg. And uh, I heard many people uh, uh, in different international meetings saying, okay, my patient didn't have apnea for the last uh, two, three weeks. So uh, why should we keep a drug that's not needed? Well, wrong, because uh, if you want to decrease caffeine, stop caffeine, I would say you don't stop it because he doesn't ap have apnea. You stop it because you keep it probably till 30, 32 weeks. And then you think of stopping it. You look at uh, the histogram and the trends and number of apneas if there are apneas. So if you have this favorable histogram and no apneas, then it's time to decrease it. Not because he didn't have apnea. Optimize respiratory support, go up from what you're having or go down based on uh, uh, your histogram. Now, again, the CPAP, moving from CPAP to high flow nasal cannula. One, uh, there is clear literature from Australia, Melbourne and uh, different places in Australia that uh, CPAP is better than high flow nasal cannula. So when should we move? But they showed that uh, uh, at initial treatment, CPAP is better than high flow nasal cannula, but at uh, weaning, CPAP is equal to high flow nasal cannula. These are non-inferiority trials. So my suggestion recommendation would say to keep the CPAP till at least 30 weeks. And then when you think of going from CPAP to high flow nasal cannula, you wouldn't do it when you're still above 0.3 of FiO2. You, you look at the favorable histogram for respiratory rate and SpO2. And also the work of breathing. You, the nurses keep moving the patient from nasal cannula to mask to nasal cannula to mask. So he will have short times of CPAP. So the nurse will tell you when I take him off CPAP, he immediately deteriorated. So it's telling you it's too early to take out CPAP. So it is too blunt to come and say, okay, he's doing well with CPAP, let's move to high flow nasal cannula. Look at the histogram at the work of breathing, ask the nurses, how does he tolerate off CPAP? I tried, we bought four ventilators. I tried what's called PRICO, intelligent control of oxygenation. Uh, meaning the ventilator itself will increase FiO2, decrease FiO2 according to, this, to the saturation. Well, we tried it, but the ventilator that they gave us, the company, uh, wasn't measuring the saturation correctly and all the process was wrong. So they were in a rush to sell us ventilators. So at the end, what we needed, so we bought the ventilators without the automatic control of oxygenation. But it's a good theory that let the ventilator increase and decrease oxygen all day long. Uh, certainly watch on other factors that are associated, if associated with hypoxia would cause problem like uh, hyperoxia, anemia, uh, low pulsatility index. Before last slide, in summary, chronic intermittent hypoxia is common in very preterm, very low birth weight infant. It promotes a pro-inflammatory pro-oxidant cascade leading to short and long-term mortality and morbidity as we showed you. Histogram and trends may be, um, may be uh, used, not sued, <laughs> may be used to identify and quantify hypoxic and hyperoxic event. They also can be used to guide weaning and escalation of support. But start, uh, we need to remember that we don't know much about this subject and there is not enough uh, evidence in the literature to tell you what to do. So it's a bit like in this picture, those people are walking their invisible dog. So you don't want to unleash an invisible dog because that invisible dog could be like the ROP in the past, which caused so much blindness. So that invisible dog, you wanna know if this is uh, this dog on the left or that dog on the right before you unleash it.